You are listening to a podcast from Essendon Presbyterian Church in Melbourne, recorded 10 a.m. on September 8, 2024, presented by Rev. Chris Duke. Revelation 5, 1 to 14. And I saw in the right hand of him who sat on the throne a scroll written inside and on the back sealed with seven seals. Then I saw a strung angel proclaiming with a loud voice, Who is worthy to open the scroll and to loose its seals? And no one in heaven or on the earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll or to look at it. So I wept much because no one was found worthy to open and read the scroll or to look at it. But one of the elders said to me, Do not weep. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has prevailed to open the scroll and to loose its seals. And I looked, and behold, in the midst of the throne and of the four living creatures and in the midst of the elders stood a lamb, as though it had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. Then he came and took the scroll out of the right hand of him who sat on the throne. Now when he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and the twenty-four elders fell down before the Lamb, each having a harp and a golden bowl full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sang a new song, saying, You are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals, for you were slain and and have redeemed us to God by your blood. Out of every tribe and tongue and people and nation, and have made us kings and priests to our God, and we shall reign on the earth. Then I looked, and I heard the voice of many angels around the throne, the living creatures and the elders, and the number of them was ten thousand times ten thousand, and thousands of thousands, saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honour and glory and blessing. And every creature which is in heaven and on the earth and under the earth and such as, as are in the sea and all that are in them, I heard saying, Blessing and honour and glory and power be to him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb forever and ever. Then the four living creatures said, Amen. And the 24 elders fell down and worshipped him who lives forever and ever. May the Lord bless to us this morning the reading of his word. Let us pray. Dear gracious Heavenly Father, as we unpack these words from these two chapters, Lord, we ask that you would bless them to us. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we're dealing with the topic of elders at the moment and uh, um, when we come to the Greek, um, the Greek word for elder is presbyteros and now I just know that uh, Costa's going to tell me how to pronounce that properly but that's the way I pronounce it in the English, presbyteros and it means elder and there's another word in the Greek, uh, episkopos, which means bishop, overseer. And so we get the idea of elders as uh, rulers and, uh, and leaders in the church. And today I want us to consider why the church has elders. What is the purpose and the role of an elder as we find from God's word? In doing so, I want us to examine these questions in context of Revelations 4, Revelation 4 and 5. Now, Revelation opens in chapters 3 um, Uh, 2 and 3, with letters to the seven churches in Asia Minor. And these letters are the direct communication from the Lord Jesus Christ himself. And so when we come to Revelation 4 and 5, we come to it through a vision, we now step into the throne room of heaven. And so as you gaze into the throne room of heaven, no doubt there are countless wonders that would fascinate and amaze you. However, from John's eye, his attention is turned to only one thing. In Revelation 4.2 we read, Immediately I was in the Spirit, 
And behold, a throne set in heaven, and one sat on the throne. One of the great themes of Revelation 4 and 5 is the sovereignty and the reign of the living God. Of course, the book of Revelation was originally written for the suffering church in John's day, where it faced increasing opposition and persecution in a hostile Roman Empire. And whilst there's drama and there's mystery and there's symbolism that unfold in this wonderful book, there's also wonderful assurance that whatever the suffering of the people of God endure as followers and disciples of Jesus Christ, God has already triumphed. Our God reigns over the world and over the, over the flesh and the devil as the great king upon the throne in heaven reigns. That's why the throne is positioned, friends, in the centre when viewing all that is seen emanates outwards and in expanding circles from it. And so hopefully you can picture this scene clearly in your mind. Now the throne is described in Revelation 1 verses 1 to 6 and then in verse 4 we're told that there are 24 lesser thrones that encircle the great throne of God. And sitting on these lesser thrones are 24 elders. And then in verse 6 are described, uh, we have here described four strange living creatures, angelic beings who surround the 24 elders whose eyes are covered with their six wings. The first one looks like a lion, the second one looks like an ox, and the third one looks like a man. And the fourth one looks like an eagle. They're all singing praises to God. And then in Revelation 5.11, we get a view of a grand angelic choir that numbers in thousands and tens of thousands and thousands upon thousands and then circling the throne is the rest of the created universe so that every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and under the sea, or in the sea, all of them burst into song. Now John witnesses this amazing wave of heavenly worship that pulsates outward from the throne of God until every creature everywhere joins the worship of of the triune God. And this is a scene that should amaze and take away your breath. Today I want us to look at, the, especially at the 24 elders. And in doing so, consider this question, why does the church have elders? What are elders for? In answering this question, I want to consider three things. First, the elders that we see are leaders. Secondly, the elders that we see are worshippers. And thirdly, the elders that we see are pastors. Elders are leaders, worshippers and pastors. Now firstly, as we think about the role of leaders in the church or the role of elders as leaders, there are four attributes of leadership that I want us to consider. The first one is privilege, second is power, the third is purity, and the fourth is prayer. If you like, here we have the four Ps of attributes of elders. Now, thinking about the idea of privilege, we come to Revelation 4, verse 4. Let's have a look at it. Around the throne were 24 thrones, and on the thrones I saw 24 elders sitting clothed in white robes, and they had crowns of gold on their heads. So there are 24 elders and this number likely represents the patriarchs of the 12 tribes of Israel combined with the the 12 apostles of Christ. Symbolically represented here are the whole people of God, the church of the Old and the New Testament, the people of God. Not two churches but one church, one people of God gathered around the throne of their Redeemer God. 
Now, in viewing this scene, it's significant with those who are seated, uh, who are seated closest to the throne. Not the four living creatures, not the, in, the uh, unnumberable or innumerable angelic sim- singers, nor the representatives, rep- representatives of the whole people of God. Those who are seated in the innermost circle are there by way of privilege. The church of Jesus Christ shows us here the closest possible fellowship with the God of all glory, closer than any other creature in heaven or on earth. And this privilege belongs to the elders in John's vision. Yes, let's keep in mind that this scene is symbolic in its character. And I don't want to press the point too far in saying that these idyllic and symbolic elders in heaven still teach us about the work and the privilege of every real elder on earth. Yes, all Christians possess the immense privilege of living in close proximity to the throne of God. We have access to the throne of God through faith in Christ Jesus. Through faith is our birthright or is the birthright of every single child of God. But an elder is called to live up to this privilege. How many of us live well below our privileges? How often we live as if we don't have free, unrestricted access to the throne of grace. We live as if we're not adopted children in God's family with all the rights and the privileges that that gives us. We live as if we have no reason for joy. But John's vision reminds us of the wonder of our privileges. We live in intimate proximity to the one who reigns who reigns upon the throne of the entire universe where we can go to him any time in prayer. Elders are meant to model such a life. Here may we be reminded of the blessedness that belongs to all of us in Christ Jesus. The great privileges that are ours to live close to the throne of grace, to come with boldness to obtain mercy and find grace in our time of need. The elders lead us by representing to us the wonder of our privilege, living up to the privileges that are ours by living close to the throne. Secondly, elders lead us in the exercise of power. Returning to the vision, the elders are sitting on 24 thrones, Each of them is wearing a crown, a golden crown, on their head. No matter what you may say about these symbolic elders, they are certainly rulers. They occupy a position, not only of privilege, but of power. To them belongs a kingly role, subordinate to the great king himself, because their thrones are lesser thrones that surround the greater throne. For they still sit on thrones. In the Presbyterian Church of Australia, elders are called ruling elders. They exercise a ministry of governance. In the New Testament, elders are also called overseers, from which we get the Greek word episkopai, or episkopoi, that is bishops. What this means is the good management and ordering of the life and government of the church. When God gives elders to his church, what we see is God's kindness from the one who reigns on the throne, on his throne. He cares enough about us to give us elders, to see to the good order and the wise government of our congregation. And that should make us profoundly grateful, friends. Our God is caring and he's attentive as he presides on his throne in heaven. Elders lead by living up to their privileges, but they also are called to lead by the right exercise of church power. They are governors. Thirdly, elders lead in their conduct by embodying Christian purity. Notice in verse 4, the elders are clothed in white robes. 
In Revelation, white garments are always used to depict the people of God. A white garment is the dress of the Christian in the book of Revelation. And later in uh, chapter 7, verse 14, believers are those who have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. So if you trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, you're someone who is clean. That's the point of the image. Your garments have been washed and made white in the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God. All the stain of your sin and all the stain of your guilt is gone forever and praise God for that. But it's extraordinary that the elders seen in our passage are the very first people that John sees in his vision that are dressed in white. In Revelation 1, Jesus (coughs) is described as radiant and dazzling in his purity, but we're not shown anything about his robes. In Revelation 3, Jesus, the risen Christ, promises Christians if they overcome, they will be dressed in white garments. But the first people John sees who are dressed this way are the 24 elders who are sitting in this prominent position in the view of everyone and their embodiments of purity, of the purity that Jesus promises to all his people. Said another way, elders are called to be examples of Christian holiness. They're not called to be holier than other people, as if there are different moral standards for elders and others. That's not the point that's been said here, rather elders are called to embody and model the same standard of holiness which we're all called to. And as we look at these elders, we're meant to look at the elders in our own congregation and aspire to grow to the same kind of maturity and godliness that we see displayed in them. Friends, do you pray for your elders, for their purity, for their holiness, that they would indeed model purity and holiness in their lives. And fourthly, elders lead us by prayer. Revelation 5.8 says this, each having a harp and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. So what are the elders doing? They're bringing the prayers of the saints. Then the saints here refers to every Christian. If you're a Christian, then you're a saint. You're a holy one. You're set apart by the grace of God. That's what it means. This means at least this, that elders are greatly invested in the ministry of intercession, in prayer. Elders make the prayer burdens of the flock of God, the burden of their own hearts. It's an elder's duty to be men who pray, occupied by bringing the prayers of the church to the Lord. Prayer is one of the principal works of an elder. It's their main business. Elders are called to a ministry of prayer. And that's how elders lead us. It's not their decision making, nor wise and careful policies, albeit how important they might be. They lead us first by being men, often at the throne of grace, on their knees, pleading for the cause of Christ in your life. And sometimes prayer doesn't seem like very much at all. It can feel like a very inadequate response. Most of us just want to be doing. We want to be doing something. We want to respond to challenges with action. And so we form a committee. We call a meeting and we develop a plan. That's the Presbyterian way. But that's not the picture we see here. John shows us the height of a faithful elder and what they're doing is prayer. What did the early New Testament do in a crisis? As you view uh, from time after time in the book of Acts, the church at every crisis doesn't plan and then act. First, uh, It doesn't do its actions first. Rather, it gathers to pray. The church turns to prayer. Prayer is the great work of elders. Elders are leaders and they lead by living up to their privilege by staying close to the throne of grace. They lead by the just exercise of 
of church power. They lead by modelling the same purity promised to every Christian and they lead by being men of prayer. And so elders are leaders. Pray that the Lord would give you elders like this. Secondly, elders are worshippers. John's view of Revelation 4 and 5 is the worship service of heaven. As I read these chapters and meditate on them, I'm just looking forward to seeing something of this order. Look how the worship service around the throne proceeds. First, the four living creatures begin to sing, holy, holy, holy. Now, we sang it very well just a moment ago. But just imagine the, the tens of thousands upon thousands upon thousands singing, holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. When the elders hear this song, these elders who lead in privilege and power and purity and prayer, who sit nearest to the throne in a place of prominence and dignity, what do they do? In verse 10, the 24 elders fall down before him who sits on the throne and worship him who lives forever and ever and cast their crowns before the throne saying, you are worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honour and power for you created all things and by your will they exist and were created. They don't boast because they're sitting on thrones near to the throne of God. They don't boast because they're wearing crowns on their heads. They don't think that their place of prominence or the position of power should attract the admiration of anyone, least of all from the one seated on the throne. Rather, they humbly fall from their seats, remove their crowns and cast them at the feet of their saviour so that he gets all the glory and all the praise. What authority they might have, what power they might have, they use only to magnify the Lord. And this is the opposite of how we often think about leadership. And it's the opposite of how we think about position and the exercise of power today. We want to be recognised and we want to be honoured. But these elders don't care about their own reputation or any honour that they might think that they deserve. They give everything, they surrender everything and they lay it at the feet of the one who reigns on the throne of glory. And that's the essence of true worship. It's not a show. It's not saying the right words. These elders cast their crowns at Jesus' feet for he alone is worthy. That's what these elders think. And that's what they do. Look at the song they sing in Revelation 5, verses 9 to 10. And they sang a new song saying, You are worthy to take this scroll and to open its seals, for you were slain and have redeemed us to God by your blood out of every tribe and tongue and people and nation and have made us kings and priests to our God and we shall reign on the earth. And so here they're singing about the cross. They're singing about how Jesus has saved them and how he saved us. It's the gospel that has pride of place in their hearts and their praise erupts out of adoration for the Lord Jesus. So elders should hold the gospel at the centre of their heart. Has the gospel got a hold of your heart like this? Do you see the wonder of it? Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God, the Lion of Juba, Judah, who died to make you king and priest so that you might fall from your throne to cast your crown before him. The elder isn't the one who is special and friends, might I remind you, nor are you or I. But Jesus stands at the centre amidst these four living creatures among the elders, Jesus is the epicentre, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the lamb standing as though he had been slain and he is worthy. 
I'm not worthy, you're not worthy, but he is gloriously worthy to receive power and wealth and wisdom and might and honour and glory and blessing. For he is worthy. He's given everything to make you his so you can get down from your throne and tip your crown from your head and adore him. Elders are to be worshippers before and above all else. Worshippers of the triune living God, Father, Son and Holy Spirit. Worshippers who are captured and captivated by the wonder of the love of God and his Son and the Holy Spirit who gave himself, his Son especially, for your deliverance from the power of sin over your life. Elders are leaders and are worshippers. Now thirdly, elders are pastors. In Revelation 5, the heavenly worship service gets interrupted. There's a pause in heaven's worship. There's tension. God is holding a scroll in his hand, a scroll with seven seals. And the scroll is a picture of God's purpose and plan, the unfolding that describes the deliverance of his church and the salvation of sinners and of judgment of sin and death and Satan forever. And no one can open the scroll. It seems as, like, as John looks, that the purpose of God is doomed to fail. Righteousness, righteousness will not prevail, justice will not come, evil wins. That's what it seems like. And this is no small disappointment. In fact, it's a cosmic disaster and it's so devastating to John that he weeps loudly. He's sobbing loudly. He's wailing loudly, friends. Get that picture. But in verse 5 it says... But one of the elders said to me, Do not weep. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has prevailed to open the scroll and to loose its seven seals. John turns to look for this conquering lion, but he sees the lamb standing as though it had been slain in the centre of the throne. He sees Jesus who was crucified and is risen and only he can open the scroll. Only he is able to bring the saving plan of God to fulfilment. He has purchased sinners from the clutches of death and hell and he thwarts, the, he, he uh, stops the purposes of evil. He has triumphed. Now, the elder doesn't come to John and put his arm around him and say, now, now, don't cry over spilled milk or anything. He doesn't say anything along those lines. He doesn't say, you know, tomorrow it will be a new day. He says, look, look at the Lion of Judah, the Lamb who was slain, but he has prevailed. He hasn't left suffering and sin and death had the last word, friends. No, God has acted decisively in his Son. Jesus Christ has won the victory so that the promises of God will triumph and God's plans will not fail. In Jesus, he has died but is alive again and now he reigns forever. This is the message that dries John's tears and comforts his heart, that's the message that makes elders and angels and every creature in heaven and on earth sing praises. Elders are pastors. Is the elder pastoring with platitudes and pleasantries? No. This elder pastors with the gospel of God's salvation in Jesus Christ, who alone is mighty to save. Elders are not called to be political trendsetters or public speakers or people managers. They're called to be pastors. They're called to be faithful shepherds who will point you relentlessly 
to the true shepherd, the only true shepherd of your heart and what your heart needs. They point you to Jesus. They will say, Behold the lion of the tribe of Judah. Weep no more. Fill your gaze with the one who stands in the middle of the throne, the lamb who has been slain but is now alive. That's what elders are really for. Elders are leaders and they're worshippers and they're pastors. Elders are leaders, worshippers and pastors, but a leader who is not first and supremely a worshipper will not be a good pastor. A leader firstly needs to be a supremely a good pastor. And so they will be a good pastor if they're a worshipper. A leader who falls from his throne to cast his crown at the feet of Christ, who joins the great congregation, not as someone special, but as just one of the redeemed who owes it all to Christ alone. That's the leader that we need and that's the leader that we seek. And I want to say in our church government, we do this in uh, plurality. We do this with many, many elders. We seek leaders who will shepherd the flock of Christ with tenderness and compassion and joy because he knows that he is, just as we know we all are, debtors. That is, we are debtors to the mercy of Christ. Well, let's reflect on these thoughts today. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you pray with me still again? Lord Jesus, we thank you that you gift your church with elders. And we pray, Lord, that you will continue to raise up men who will serve you in this capacity, men who are leaders and worshippers and pastors according to your word. And, Lord, we pray that you would gift us also with such men as time unfolds. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. More messages of hope at Essendon Presbyterian Church.org.au or wherever you get your podcasts from.